You're on. Oh, well, after we're being recorded, you're on, Mark. Okay, I'll get started. Firstly, for the people uh, here, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really interesting, the amazing amount of research that's been done on COVID-related issues by UCLA researchers. And um, I, one thing I'd like to say is that this is seat of your pants research. This is an ep epidemic that we haven't, uh, like the like of which you haven't seen be before. And it's required both from a met methodological standpoint and a um, data collection stand standpoint to do things in, in real time. So uh, I find it really impressive, the range and the depth of research being done by UCLA faculty. So what I'd like to do is just to do a couple of things. Uh, the work that Chris, Chris, Christina presented shows an aggregate result, say for a state of California. For interest, I wanted to uh, drill, drill down at sort of more local measures of it. So what I have on the um, image here is actually something I did for fun. I wrote a robot to go to the LA County website and read off, off them the incident counts of the number of um, COVID counts per, per day. And then I ran through a, uh, actually a state-of-the-art um, model, uh, one of the um, uh, similar or simplified version of the model that Christina was talking about, to look at each neighborhood in uh, LA, which is 277, that have an order of around 50,000 people in each, and measure the uh, reproductive number. I won't go in and define this, I'm, ha I'm happy to, but I'm thinking that the, given the degree which people are probably combing news, newspapers and news, news sites, the re reproductive number is not something that's novel to our folks. But what I really wanted to point out, this is for the city of Santa Monica, what's happened since the data was first recorded. You can see it bumping up and, and down. And this is the most recent data as of a couple of days ago. And the current R, or the best estimate of it's about 1.14. West, Westwood, we're doing a little better here now, but I just wanted to point out a couple of other neighborhoods just to point out how localized this epidemic is. Bel Air, you see it has a change that's north of us. West, Westchester, which is a mixed neighborhood just north of um, LAX, 1.13. Beverly Wood, which is just south of um, Beverly Hills. East Los Angeles, uh, which as you probably know is a very, uh, um, a very demographically, a very large amount of uh, folks from East Los, uh, sorry, uh, Hispanic folks in it, 97%. It's R uh, is substantially higher, 1.335. And uh, then Maywood and Compton, which are uh, high proportion African American, also 1.3. So their rates are, are much higher. In all of these neighborhoods, all I've looked at, we do see uh, this sort of wobbling in and around one, uh, and certainly uh, regions where it's dipped below one, but now um, we're getting up to numbers which are substantially higher. At the same time, more importantly, this is in essence a rate measure that the prevalence is also high. So as a result, you multiply the prevalence by the rate and that's not good. So uh, just for everyone, you probably know this, but this time it's different. Uh, that's uh, all I'll say. Uh, I'll, I'll just measure, show one other fun thing uh, before I get to some things I wanted to say. Uh, this, uh, you can do the same things uh, by looking at say this figure, which you see here are actually just the uh, incidence rate per 100,000 people for the same areas in, involved. So this is uh, East Los Angeles, uh, predominantly Hispanic. And then this is Compton and, um, uh, Maywood, so this is African American, this is the West Side, uh, and this is Bel Air. So just as demographers, there's sort of a prima facie issue of uh, inequality here as well, um, that we should, uh, must be taken into account when we start thinking about these. We normally think about them sort of in a pure um, demographic and epidemiological sense, but clearly there's a strong interaction with these other forces, which which should, is really important to take into account. This is a social epidemic and that's a vital aspect of it. But you can see where, where we are now. And this was a bump in middle late ju uh, July. So we're way above, above that. All right, the last thing I'll say, there's up of other figures here, which is sort of of interest, but I wanted to end with the raw data because this is a segue to the other point I wanna make. 
So what we've done is we've broken it down from a state level to maybe a county level, and then within the county to about order of 50,000 people, a local level. The epidemics in each of these are all connected and related to each other, but they're also separate. Now, we also want to separate the idea of what is a public health decision, where we make decrees at a state level, then at a county level, to something more at a personal risk risk level. Now, they have different roles. It's not as if one is right and one is wrong. But measuring personal risk, we want to look at something much more localised, because it says the epidemic around us. So these are the actual incident counts, and you can see what's going on. The smooth curve is just a relatively simple curve fitting to uh, this. Um, and this is, uh, um, you can see the actual counts. The blue, blue line is the most recent count. So you don't need to be a statistician to see the blue line is typically above most of these curves. Um, so that's not good um, in a nutshell. And in particular, these high risk areas here, you can see the uh, effects are huge. You know, this is, uh, you know, 106 cases. This is 203 um, cases. These incident rates are extremely high. All right, so I just wanted to show that just to, to get a sense of more localized. The actual research work I've done for the WHO um, focuses on the natural extension of this idea uh, in which we look at uh, looking at outbreak data, uh, looking at uh, local outbreak uh, data and doing a network analysis of that outbreak data to get very accurate measures of the reproductive number and other epidemiological com components, but also to model contact tracing. I'll briefly say about this, and then I've got a lot of technical details, which I'll answer in questions. So we probably all know what contact tracing is, um, but you know, just to touch base on some core I I ideas, it's a key component of, uh, oh, looks like my pencil just stopped working. All right, I won't worry about that. Uh, it's a key component of um, outbreak control. So the core idea is this is you're dealing with an area which does not have uh, prevalence, and then you have a case imported to that area, and there's an outbreak involved with it, and then you have people infected from that initial infection. Initially, uh, when we started this work, what we thought would happen is that uh, it would the disease would be controlled locally in a large number of countries. And then what we would deal with would be outbreaks. Um, that, of course, is not proven to be the case, uh, except in a few countries. Uh, so this would be much more relevant to actually the latest stage of the ep epidemic, where a large proportion of people are being vaccinated. And we still have, uh, so the overall prevalence is low, but we still have out out outbreaks. And the key question there is that is this outbreak going to lead to a massive increase in the large numbers of people, or is it going to die die, die out with natural con, con, controls? So the core idea is to think about contact tracing as a data source, where we take the data from it, analyze that that data to understand uh, the epidemic uh, overall, and also um, uh, how to modify contact tracing. So just to say a few things about that, it's really about uh, the effectiveness and the efficacy. So we would measure things like the, uh, the reproductive number, the secondary attack rate, uh, things, things like that. They're of great interest to epidemiologists. But what also, and this is probably the more interesting thing, the efficiency here, where what we want to do is uh, an issue is how do we um, how do we go about making contact tracing more efficient? Because it's very capital and human intensive. And so a natural question would be, you know, how do we, uh, how long do we uh, quarantine people? Uh, when we do con contact tracing, do we contact trace everybody? Or do we contract trace people differ dif differentially based on their characteristics and so on? How can we improve the efficiency of it? So they're the sort of things we've been working on, and I could expand on it more about uh, things that um, are very relevant to this process, but I'll just leave, leave that here. I'll end with an example just to show where it's, what's going on. And this is an example we have actually published. Uh, we, we contact trace a, an outbreak in a bar in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, that occurred in March of 2020. So what happened is this is an expat bar, and uh, a whole bunch of people turned turned up, and there were 19 confirmed cases uh, from from that. And there were 298 people in the bar, 
and um, of it, there was a total outbreak, which, which they stopped using contact tracing. Now, the WHO went in and collected data using their GoData plat platform, which is a software they hand out to everybody to uh, map the uh, contact net, net networks. And we were extremely interested in these particular things, a proportion of asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic and symptomatic cases. And keep in mind, this is very early in the epidemic where the proportion asymptomatic and these basic numbers weren't known. So uh, I won't go through those, but I'll sort of finish here. I could show you a lot of the statistics, but the key thing I want to get to is this, is that by looking at individual level data, where you look at the bar who is infected at the bar, asymptomatic, sim symptomatic, pre-symptomatic, who they had contact with, these people are in a household, these people worked together, and model this degree of contact, you can gain an enormous amount of information from a small number of people by looking at, at this detail and taking their network information into account. So that's exactly what we're doing. We build a statistical model, but not at the aggregate level, at the individual level. And because of that, we're using a lot more inf information and we can get a lot better estimates from the process. So I think I'll stop here, um, but I can explain a lot about statistically what, what we're doing, but what I've said are the most important points. Thank you, Mark. Ending early even. You guys have both been terrific role models. So, all right. So now we have about 20 minutes for questions. So please, I can't see everybody. So please just pipe up with your question. Well, I'll ask a question. Um, so Mark, when you are looking at these individual networks for a local area, do you aggregate individual networks up to larger local entities or how do you, what do you do with them once you do, I, I haven't had a chance to look at your article, but when you construct them, what do you do with them? Well, uh, in, 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 in this case, an example in the paper, it's a single tree because we had a single outbreak at, at the bar and we didn't know who infected who at the bar. In fact, we do not know to this day who the original person was, but we do know it was imported from the outside of Vietnam. So as a result, we could follow that single network and analyze it as a complete whole. Uh, also note that through contact tracing, it was stopped. And then we followed ev everybody out uh, you know, until they were recovered from the disease. If you had multiple outbreaks, which are the, the trees were separate, you would in fact just aggregate them up uh, from, it would typically come through multiple importation. Um, so note what we're doing is we're acting as if we're in a case where we've got a, in essence an open field and a few cases have come in like fire outbreaks and mm. we can map them all separately. Very cool. And Chris had one question for you. So can you talk more and maybe Mark also about, so, you know, we have this binary idea of, you know, positive, not positive in testing, but you were talking about something um, that was a third category, which was more about sort of how much viral load somebody has and talking about the testing process itself, actually being able to give us an indicator of that. Can you say a little bit more about that? Christina, you're on mute. Absolutely. So um, the gold standard right now is uh, PCR. And so PCR- um, Can you say uh, what PCR stands for? Uh, polymerase chain reaction. And so what you do is you take your, your sample and you have uh, specific uh, primers, which are nucleotides uh, that, that bind to it. And you take that sample and then you amplify it. And each amplification is a doubling of the amount of genetic material you have. And um, you keep doing this up to 40 cycles. So you've amplified it, you've doubled it 40 times. And the number of cycles that you need to do before you see a positive signal is the cycle threshold. And it is inversely related to uh, the viral load. And this is a lot of stuff that, um, that I myself learned when dealing with uh, HIV, because uh, 
I uh, started my career out in uh, HIV and have branched out to other infectious diseases. But uh, we know that uh, people with higher viral load are much more likely to transmit. And so uh, uh, as Mark was showing, the, uh, the combinatorics can get really uh, large, very fast in contact tracing. And so um, since we already have sort of continuous data, which is cycle thresholds, which actually with the standard curves can be um, translated into the viral load, we can actually quantify the number of viral particles per ml of sample. And uh, which is, uh, I think, easier for people to understand, but even cycle thresholds would be a, um, a step above uh, than just the binary. Because as a statistician, you know, when you have something that is um, sort of underlying continuous, when you dichotomize it, you can lose information. And so um, I would um, just love to have uh, sort of the cycle threshold numbers to really see what proportion of these people are uh, really highly infectious because these are the people that are most likely to create these super spreading events. Mm -hmm. And to look at these distributions, I think would be useful um, uh, from a statistical uh, standpoint to be able to predict, um, to predict the spread. But I would also imagine it would be really useful in terms of contact tracing mm -hmm. uh, to really focus on the ones that are the highest likelihood to, um, to create these super spreading events, you know, because Mark mentioned, you know, maybe we, uh, and they were looking at people like, okay, you're in church, you have a high number of contacts. And so to add that extra layer uh, of uh, virology, I think would be really useful to help make contact tracing uh, much more effective because uh, right now it's a huge combinatorics problem to get these people out of circulation as fast as we can to keep yeah. them from spreading. Because some of, they don't even know that they're infected. Sure. But also, uh, this will also help determine, you know, like asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic, posse-symptomatic, because some people just, it's like, it's like my kids, you know, my daughter, she gets uh, really sick and it's like, she's dying and my son, he can have a high fever. It's like, oh no, I'm fine. And, and we don't know if someone's truly asymptomatic till after, till the, the end. And so instead of just sort of waiting for that to have the cycle threshold, I think would be uh, really helpful. And okay. we already, uh, the data already exists. I would just love to see that um, uh, given with, with cases. Great, so we have a question from Tommy Gaines. Tommy, do you wanna say your question? Tommy? Oh, I. I Go ahead. Why don't you repeat your question, Tommy? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Christina, for the presentation. It was really wonderful. And I was hoping you could elaborate more on this case uh, velocity measure that you had mentioned. So, you know, you mentioned the pitfalls of using case data being that it's too noisy and it's correlated with testing. So we don't really get a full picture of the cases. And instead, it sounds like you're using case velocity to approximate the data we don't have. Um, no. Uh the case velocity is data that we do have. And um, here, I will uh, share this again. And so um, it is, oh, let me, if I can find, where to share screen? There we go, share screen, here we go. And so uh, it is just one way to look at the data. And so when we were, um, cause we, we got a call at the end of February to start modeling and we were just, uh, finding that if we actually took the first derivative, because here you can see in this one that it seems to be a little bit better behaved than uh, you see this massive spread you see here with just case counts versus the, uh, the case velocity. And so uh, we decided uh, early on that case velocity actually uh, had less noise because this is the data. I mean, I am so grateful that they're actually uh, making all of this data public. You know, New York Times, COVID Tracking Project, Johns Hopkins. Uh, I really like the sort of democratization of data. And we just chose to use um, the velocity because we got better predictive power from it. Does that all answer right. your question? Yeah, and has this been published? 
oh my goodness, it has been under review for the longest time. We are in our final, final reviews for it. And so we are uh, confident after our second round of reviews that it will be uh, published, but it is up as a, uh, a preprint. It has been up there for like seven months. And so, uh, so yeah, it is uh, widely um, uh, um, available uh, through the preprint service yeah. and is on the, uh, the website for- Yeah, I should, this is a good time for me to remind everybody that a lot of these papers by Mark and Christina and by our other two speakers are up on the CCPR website for this seminar. So please go have a look. Um, so Till, you had a question. Yes, um, I'm a, a labor economist and I've been thinking of ways how to get data to uh, see whether infections have occurred through the job and how so staying at home and getting unemployment insurance may have affected the spread of infections. And um, it's always difficult to merge <clears throat> to get individual level data, data with names and SSNs on health outcomes. So one data source would could use is mortality, uh, COVID-19 related mortality. And I'd be curious on your view, if, if it's sort of, you think it fits in the discussion, whether instead of doing what you were describing with infections, you could do something similar with mortality, sort of seeing whether, you know, mortality due to COVID-19 for somebody at a certain workplace may allow you to see whether there's additional deaths occurring in that workplace and say in the neighborhoods of the individual, of the places of residence. This uh, sounds like a of, question of, yeah. for Mark, right? And, I mean, this sound, you're ask, it sounds like a question you're asking Mark, right? Till yeah, I, th I, th I think Mark, uh, and, and happy to take that offline if you feel that goes too far as a field. Well, I'm giving a brief answer. And uh, so I should first note it's outside my ex uh, expertise area. So it's an, an informed opinion, but not an expert one. Uh, one of the issues was that the death rates are really dependent upon, uh, you know, the health status of the individuals involved. So if you want to look at a direct relationship between incidents, having the disease and death, that's going to be a quite complex process because if those propensity to die varied greatly by key demographic char characteristics, that's going to make that linkage quite difficult. Uh, so I think that would be the major concern. If you moved it away from that, if you didn't address for that, in a gross sense, you, yes, you could use a very similar uh, approach to it. But that linkage needs to be made and needs to be quite, quite strong. Uh, I actually think the best way to go is to try to use contact tracing data. But of course, that opens another can of worms. Yeah. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions if people have them. I have a million questions, but I'm going to try to restrain myself. I have a question. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez and doc, doc, Dr. Hancock for your presentations. Have you all considered the changes to the CDC quarantine guidelines in your modeling from 14 days to 10 days or seven days in a test? Yes, absolutely. So that is our uh, inverse row parameter for infectious ones. And so, yeah, we have... Um, included that. And I think they changed that based on uh, the virology, showing that they could not culture infectious virus from anybody post um, nine days. Yeah, I'd say from my work, it's all been done with the Western Pacific region. So the CDC guide, guide, guidelines are you know, not directly relevant. But in principle, yes, if the guidelines change, it's vitally important to take into account any of those measurement changes into the entire process. That's great. Um, who else? I have a question. Uh, this is Rock. Speaking. Please. Rock. Yeah, just wondering. I mean, thank you so much for this great research, and I'm just wondering, like, in an ideal world, like, what would be the like the sort of like measures that you would recommend uh, to like sort of like spread the virus, um, you know, in this environment uh, where we have like another spike again? Um, what would you like? From your model uh, insights, what would you say would be like the the best uh, route of action um, if we had uh, you know all the resources? And anyone can answer basically. Uh, I'll 
go first. I'm, I'm, Christina is probably going to answer too. I, I like, you know, the re reproductive number gives you a rate. It's a local measure. Uh, I think if you can get a local measure, it, it's important uh, what spatial scale it's, it's over. But I think that's a good sense of where the epidemic's going. But the actual prevalence rate itself, in a, in a gross sense, you know, the prevalence rate paired with a re reproductive number gives, gives you a sense of the scale of what uh, an individual's facing at that point. But if I'm misunderstanding your question, please re re restate it. No, no, this, this is great. Uh, so yeah, so basically like tracking the reproductive number, but um, but in addition, like, because um, uh, like, you were talking also about contact tracing, uh, but I'm wondering if like, uh, like the, you know, giving like some of the measures from the CDC and like the, the lockdowns and, and, and like, uh, for example, like uh, different, uh, uh, you know, like different areas of gathering, uh, limiting those, uh, how would you think uh, or would you recommend going about it to kind of like spread the virus or is it something inevitable uh, as soon as we open up, it's, it's going to spread again or is the vaccination the only uh, viable solution to that? So you're asking about policy measures, Rock. Right? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, mm -hmm. so are there insights from your modeling um, that have given you ideas about what, what policymakers might do? Well, um, well, yes, we, uh, when uh, cases and deaths go up, you, you need to do something for that. So I come back to sort of those four C's of what uh, really needs to be done to, uh, to slow the virus down. But really absent a vaccine or, um, or some sort of immunity, uh, there's, there's no way around, this virus is not going away. We were hoping that perhaps it would be seasonal and it would disappear like SARS-1 and MERS did, but that is, uh, has not happened. And so um, we really are looking at um, COVID sticking around for, um, for a, a fair bit. Okay. I'll actually add to that, it's a great question. I mean, when it was first asked, my sort of gut reaction was, well, we know that social distancing and the so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions work, and they're the only thing that works. So the notion is early, the sort of the crude answer was, look, we found something that will actually stop it. Let's just do that and then worry about the details later. And I think um, that was, I think, the initial approach in almost every country involved. There wasn't a country where it didn't apply and it applied into them all. Um, there's been work now that models when the interventions went into place and looks at the impact on the epidemic, that is actually a pretty hard to do. And there's a key issue here. And certainly for social scientists, there's something that's missing in a lot of the, liter the literature. This is a social disease. This is a social pathogen. The behavioral aspects almost dominate what's going on. So you could have very weak restrictions at a policy level if people actually obeyed the restrictions that were actually given. And so uh, the point I'm making is a lot of the epidemiological models miss probably the single most important variable, which is the behavioral component of it. So your S SIR model needs an SIRB model with a behavioral component in terms of the response. And uh, the, the point is here is that it's uh, the social science and the social aspects of this are something that aren't uh, are very difficult to take into account because it's how people respond to uh, various public orders and various public policies is a huge driver of what actually happens. And so the simple analyses of things like, you know, do, if we lock, lock, lock down, is that a good idea or not? The short answer is it depends on how people react to that order. That's a simple answer, but I think there's a lot of insight in, involved in it. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, to okay. echo Mark's Sorry, uh, Christian, go ahead. Um, that, that's exactly right. I mean, uh, Google has been uh, tracking mobility data. Uh, so um, using the metadata from phones. And so despite lockdown orders, people are still leaving their homes. And so uh, that actually has not been very, it's not been as predictive as we had hoped for uh, being able to predict cases. And so, uh, which is why, as Mark was saying, it's really a uh, difficult problem. Uh, you put these interventions and you're not seeing the, 
the effect on uh, cases and deaths, but this is also due to the fact that there's lags. And so it's really hard uh, to see because there's a lot of nuance to this that maybe does not get communicated as, as well as it possibly should. But um, as with every infectious disease, there is, there's high variance and there's a lot of nuance. So it's not just one easy solution um, for everyone. It really depends, as Mark said, on people's behavior. Do they, if there's a lockdown, do they actually follow it? So even in places with very strict lockdowns, you hear stories of these speakeasies and parties. And so um, uh, you'd see a lot of cases still and de deaths increasing there. And we're even seeing uh, deaths increase in nursing homes uh, presently, even in California. On that sad note, um, I think we'll move on to our next two presentations and, and thank you. So Mark, can you put the, uh, would you be willing to share with us your uh, city specific or, or region specific within LA graphs as well? You're, uh, you're on mute. Oh, sure. In fact, I'll cut and paste the link to both of those. They're on um, Google Drive. So they're-, they're Oh, all fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic, because I think a lot of people would be interested. Great. Okay, so um, our now Christina, I know we'll need to leave. So if she heads out, don't think it's because she isn't interested in the rest, but thank you, Christina. Um, so our next speaker, as I understand it, it, Patrick, you decided that it's, Patrick and Iram, you decided that it's better for Patrick to go first, is that yeah, right? That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So our next speaker is Patrick Hugelin from uh, Sociology and also from uh, the California Center for Population Research. And then he'll be followed by Iram Beltran Sanchez, who's also from the California Center for Population Research and from the Department of Community Health Sciences in the Fielding School of Public Health. So Patrick, you're on. Uh, thank you, Anne. Um, so I'm going to present some work I've done with uh, Michael um, and Hiram, both at CPR, um, about uh, trying to compare uh, mortality from COVID-19 across countries. Uh, you might have seen this as something that a lot of people engage in, uh, maybe because we were in an election year. Um, I'm going to try to uh, tell you a few things that I've learned doing this. And all of this uh, is very basic compared to what Christina and Mark has uh, Done. There's no, no complex modeling here. The only re I think this should be the first paper in the session. The only reason it is not is because Christina had to go. So we, uh, we are going to go down in complexity quite a bit here. Uh, a few points actually Christina made, um, whether we should look at case or death. The advantage of cases are, uh, is it's better for short-term tracking because there's a, a lag about three weeks between cases and, and, and death. Uh, but um, as she mentioned, deaths are much better estimated, um, at least in the US. Uh, we have data from the CDC on excess deaths that suggests that we may miss one in five deaths due to COVID-19, whether it's directly or indirectly. Um, but uh, looking at seroprevalence survey, it looks like we may only have one out of eight uh, infections being registered. The number of people who have been infected might be eight times the number of, of cases reported uh, by John Hopkins and, uh, and the like. Um, and I will also argue that for uh, the relevance of the death counties, I think is, is greater because the public intervention, if you remember the flatten the curve uh, uh, talks early on was not to reduce the total number of cases, but actually to spread them over time so that there would be fewer uh, deaths. Uh, so when people compare mortality across countries, there's two common metric. If you look indeed at the dashboard by John Hopkins University, they have a section on um, important trends, I think, and one is about comparing mortality. There's two of them. The first one is called the case fatality ratio. And this is the one that the, the president had in mind when he claimed you know, more of this for the title of my talk. We had the best mortality rate in, in the world. Um, which is basically a number of deaths per cases. But if you argue that we cannot really use cases because it's dependent on testing and we only uh, get, one, get one in eight, uh, you cannot use it as a denominator in this uh, case fatality ratio either. Um, so most people would rely on deaths per capita, uh, deaths per 100,000 population, which is something like the crude death rate um, in, 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 in demography. 
And uh, this is the table from, um, from John Hopkins University, ranking countries from top to bottom in terms of like the uh, top being the top, uh, the highest best per 100,000 people. And Belgium, uh, you might have heard in the news, often comes on top of this uh, list. But if you look at the, the actual country, this it's really a mixed bag. There's some very small countries in Europe, uh, San Marino and Andorra, small uh, localities in Italy and Spain. And if you go down the list, the US is doing okay, but it's sort of in the top 12. Um, here, I, I use the same, uh, the same table, but I, I show the size of the population and the density to make the point. I think uh, Mark and Christina have made the point more, more uh, eloquently than I, that your size, the population size and density matters. And looking at countries, um, some with a population of uh, 10 million or so, like Belgium and the US with 330 million, uh, don't really, doesn't really make sense. You know, the, the US is not a single epidemic, it's a collection of uh, several ones. If we had more time, this is a question I, I, I like uh, to hear Christina and Mark on, you know, what is the right level of analysis, the state, is it the county, is it the neighborhood? Um, I don't really know at this point, but I, I know the uh, the country is not right. So, what what I did um, again, enlisting the the help of, of of Mike and 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 here I'm in the process to look at different um, uh, going below the the national level and to try to look at units that had roughly the same population size uh, or at least were in the same order of magnitude. And so this is the same table ranked by a uh, good death rate from COVID. Uh, with population of 5 million of, of more. And you see that um, Belgium, which is a top country, is still high, but it's definitely it's not the highest and it's lower than the um, worst uh, affected part of Italy, uh, Lombardia or, uh, of, or Spain, Madrid, or the US, New York, New Jersey, which had population size uh, of, of roughly the same and uh, Lima, Peru as well. Um, so by this metric, uh, you see that it's quite, uh, you get quite different uh, perspective. So that's the first part. The second part is uh, age standardization. Of course, uh, demographers uh, jump on this uh, very early on. You have to standardize um, because this, uh, we know COVID-19 mortality is very age dependent. It's much higher among uh, older people. I think uh, more than half of the people who died of COVID in the US are above the age of 85, if I'm not mistaken. It's, it's about 80, 85, I think, uh, the, uh, the model age, um, the median age, sorry. So um, you have to do this. And the, the problem is that uh, initially with a lot of country, but still now with uh, some smaller uh, units uh, of analysis, if we, if we want to go to smaller uh, uh, population size and disaggregate, we don't have uh, COVID uh, reports of uh, COVID deaths by age and sex. So in this case, there's a, uh, a classic uh, method in, in demography. Uh, it's related to the comparative mortality ratio, uh, which is called indirect standardization, where you use the, the population age structure, but you borrow the age specific mortality rate from another uh, population. And this is what I've done using the CDC, the CDC has reported uh, population by age and sex for some time now. And you can actually compare, so it's a comparison of the number of deaths that you have in a particular population with the number of deaths that you would have if the population has the same age specific death rate as the US population and its own age structure. So this is, um, and so this is the comparative uh, mortality ratio and you can, multiply by the, if you want to get back to a unit that is something like a, a crude death rate, you can multiply it back by the death rate of the US and then you get this indirectly standardized crude death rate here. Uh, so the, the, so the, the lesson from this, I've been doing, I mentioned that we, um, uh, Mike has a routine that's scraped the data from uh, John Hopkins University and projection from uh, University of Washington. We have we've updated this uh, weekly since the end of uh, April. I think we are at uh, week 32 or 33 right now. Um, the lesson from this is that it, the indirect standardization works fairly well for high income countries, the Europe, uh, the, in Europe, the South Korea, the US. Here is a chart that compares the blue bar, which is the unstandardized death rate 
and the um, the two other are the indirectly or directly standardized for country where you can do the two because you have the data to to do both ways and um, you you see that what it what it does is fairly similar um, the direct or indirect standardization very similar across uh, across country uh, across country basically uh, it increased the rate it decreased the rate in European country relative to the US because they have older age population um, we're not sure it's going to work so well with Latin American country I'm going to keep this uh, I think this is something that needs more uh, research but if you compare uh, the ranking now uh, this are the rankings based on this indirectly standardized uh, rate um, you have completed and so those are the orange uh, bars that are uh, ranked and you look at the blue bar you can see how different the 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 rankings are um, and basically it as I mentioned it lowers the the rates for the uh, European country compared to the U uh, US, but it increased the rate for Latin American country and, and region uh, because they have younger age structures. So the, the, the top of the list is actually dominated by uh, Mexico, Mexican state, uh, Peru, uh, states in, in Brazil, uh, and uh, Belgium is here now uh, become at the bottom, which is where I cut the list, but it still it becomes like number 25 in, in, in that in those rankings as opposed to being the worst uh, place uh, on earth, according to uh, uh, John Hopkins University. Um, yeah. So in the time I've left, I want to talk about something else. The other measure that we can use to uh, measure the impact of COVID-19 is to look at how it affects life expectancy estimation. Um, and we can uh, do this by comparing, uh, we, we can use projection of uh, life expectancy, a life table that was projected before COVID, we add it's a life table techniques. I don't go to, I won't go into the details now, but it's in the paper. You can add more uh, deaths from COVID-19 and you could, you could look at the difference. And uh, the difference is in a number of countries and a number of, of states in the US and Mexico and Brazil, it's some region in, in Europe as well, is over one, sometime over two years, right? So about two and a half years pushing three in, in Mexico City. I only here put uh, states above a uh, certain population size, I think five uh, million again. Um, and in the, uh, in the US, um, so, so when I, it's, a, it's about 1.2 years. And of course it's based on the projection I mentioned from the University of Washington, but uh, for the end of the year, we're getting pretty close. So the, the bottom line is actually based on the estimates and the top line is based on this projection. Of course, they are converging as we approach the end of the year. And for the US, we have, we are about, we just uh, crossed last week, the threshold of, of one year of uh, difference in life expectancy. So I think it's a compelling metric because as some of uh, you, know, I posted this also in a preprint and somebody made that comment. Uh, and I think it's a good image. Life expectancy at birth is a large needle to move. So it's, it's really showing how, uh, as, how strong the impact uh, is especially it's a large needle to move because it's very sensitive to changes in mortality at young ages, but not so much at old ages. For so for uh, a cause of death with uh, median age is 80 something, to have that effect on life expectancy is quite uh, re uh, remarkable. Um, sorry, I'm going down. And uh, if you put it in historical perspective, you know the life expectancy has been going up and mostly up, but you know, it doesn't change very quickly, uh, usually by 0 0.1, 0 0.2 years is a typical increase. Uh, it's gone down by about 1 point, uh, 0.1 of a year in the three years of the uh, opioid uh, overdose crisis, but that declined by one uh, year to date and probably about 1.2 by the end of, of the, the year is quite dramatic. You could actually put uh, our life expectancy in the US back to the level it was uh, 14 years ago. So, but still, it's only one year. It's not that impressive. So, it maybe uh, to people we don't really know how life expectancy is is uh, is hard to move. It's such a large level again. Um, so, it's tending maybe to look at the worst location and the worst uh, period of time to get bigger effect. And this has been done um, not to pick on particular people, but this is, for example, a study that looks at um, here. You may see calculate the difference in life expectancy in Spain. Uh, on a weekly basis and for regions in Spain. So for example, the main result they have is that in week 13 and 14 of the year, 
life expectancy in Madrid was 15 years lower than um, it, uh, it had been uh, in the previous year. But you know, that, um, and, and I think, and what they argue, sorry, is that it's, they, they, they do this because it's an interpretable summary of the impact of life expectancy. So I'm gonna spend my last couple of minutes on what does it mean actually for life expectancy at birth to, um, to go down um, in that way? So life expectancy is an aggregate measure, me, uh, measure of, of the age-specific uh, death rate across the life, uh, lifespan. Um, it's uh, incorporate all of them. It, it has uh, a fairly intuitive metric, uh, which is the number of years uh, per per it's, it's in years per person rather than in deaths per person years, like the crude death rate. So it's easier to, to, uh, to understand 79 years than uh, 0.8 per uh, thousand, for example, uh, as a crude death rate metric. But it's um, based on, uh, I mean, the, the usual interpretation is, is the average age at death for people. And it's, it's only the case when people are uh, assumed to spend their whole life in in the condition that you use. So if you use the 15, if you use week 13 and 14 in Madrid, it's assumed that you're going to live your whole life under the condition of those couple of weeks in that particular place. And um, that, I think, becomes uh, very uh, difficult uh, to accept as a, even a, you know, as a thought process that reminds me of the, of the time loop in the Groundhog uh, Day, for example. So I've proposed an, another measure. I won't have time to go into the detail, but I think what I'm arguing is that what this change in life expectancy is, um, is measuring, it's not so much uh, the expected longevity of people who are still alive, but it's more the uh, average longevity of people who have died in the past year. So I, I suggest, I propose to measure it as the uh, mean unfulfilled uh, life uh, here, uh, lifespan, that is how much younger were people who died in 2020 uh, compared to what they could have be uh, expected to, uh, to leave um, in, if there was no, um, in the hypothetical abs absence of uh, COVID-19. And I think it looks like you want to take the floor again, so I'm going to stop here. I'm out of time, right? You have 25 seconds. Very, oh, very well, um, I can, I, I can uh, show more maybe uh, during the Q&A if you want. Uh, again, I'm proposing a, 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 I'm proposing a measure that it would be actually better at capturing exactly what we mean. Um, that is how much younger on average people who died in 2020 were compared to what they would have been otherwise. Um, I, I don't know if it's going to stick. I think life expectancy is, is still very popular. Pe most people understand what it means, so I'm not expecting to uh, replace it. Uh, but I, you know, I'm, I'm maybe a, a couple of people will will use it, and that would make me happy. We'll call it the Hooping Index. Yeah, I'm not so, married to okay. I'm not, I'm not uh, married to Mal, but uh, yes. Sure <laughs> let me move on so we make sure we give Iram enough time. And let me suggest um, that I know, I know we're going to run out of time for questions and answers. So if our speakers are willing to stay around for a few minutes mm -hmm. after 1.30, if there are more questions, uh, I'm certainly answer questions, but we'll come back to that after Iram's presentation. So uh, Iram? Yes. Let's see. Yeah, so let me share my screen. So, thank you, Anne, and thank you, all the other presenters. Let's see, I think you're now able to see my slides. Um, so thank you for inviting me to present some of the work that I've done also with Patrick and Mike and uh, one of my colleagues in, in Mexico. So I'll be extending a little bit of the work that Patrick already described. Uh, in particular, I'm gonna focus on Latin American countries and I'm gonna focus on the couple, one of the indicators that Patrick already presented in terms of the standardized indicator. And then I'll move on a little bit into some data for Mexico. So very quickly, we've seen already and the other presenters have described a little bit of the impact of the COVID-19, just of the most recent data in the US over 286 or so thousand deaths. And as uh, Professor Hivalin just mentioned, 
uh, it is quite difficult sometimes to compare across populations because there is not a level of detail of the information needed in particularly age and sometimes even age and sex. Uh, so there are different ways one might want to go around to try to compare some of these populations. So here are the indicators that Professor Hivalin just shown. Uh, he showed these two. So what I'll do is I'm going to be basing the first part of the results on this indirectly standardized indicator, and then I'll move on to a little bit of the life table approach that one might want to use to assess some of the changes. I'm going to focus uh, on Mexico for the reasons that I'm going to mention in a minute. Uh, this indicator has all the pitfalls that uh, Patrick already mentioned, although it has a little bit of advantages. Uh, to assess and to make it in some ways more meaningful as he was uh, describing. What I'll show you here is just one data point as opposed to being showing you weekly that the paper that uh, Hewlin was referring to. So I'm going to be using some of the data that was already produced uh, using these standardized indicators in many different countries. I'll, I'll show you the data in a minute and then for uh, the results that I'll be showing you from Mexico, I was going to use, I'm going to use these population projections and projected life tables. This is part of the exercise that uh, Professor Hibbling was describing, in which we use data that has been projected up to using data up to 2019, in other words, sort of in the absence of COVID 19. And then we take a second set of data that now includes uh, mortality for that year, and then we sort of compare how the life expectancy looks with and without uh, the disease in these COVID-19 effects. So for the first part, what I'll be showing you, this is the first set of results. And this is where I will spend a little bit more time just to make sense a little bit of what we have in here. So here is a figure uh, using this indirectly standardized rate. So here is the rates. These are deaths per thousand person years in here on the left uh, y, y axis. I have three panels. Here are the data for North and Central America. Here are some of the Caribbean countries. And over here are the uh, South American countries. So this is the a way of showing the, the data going back to what Patrick mentioned before that the size of the population matters so as you are probably familiar the Caribbean countries tend to be quite small some of the Central American countries are also quite small but some countries in North America like Mexico and the US are fairly large and in South America countries such as Brazil are also fairly large so here is the data for the three different regions in Latin America in the x axis, you see roughly the weeks that correspond to those months. I said roughly the weeks because we were uh, pulling data at different times during a week, so it's hard to pinpoint exactly sort of the weeks, but this gives you an idea from uh, early June until early uh, December. So there are a couple of things that I want you to look at this data. The first one here is the data for the US that is somewhere around ho hovering about over one day per. Uh, 1,000 person years. So once you put it within that context, you can see why, uh, how some Latin American countries have much more larger levels of mortality. In the case of all these countries, Mexico is way on top. For South American countries, Peru and Ecuador uh, and Brazil are sort of the top three, three countries. The second, that I want, uh, the second point that I want to make is some countries had an early start and they peaked, but then declined. So this is the case of Peru and, and Ecuador and a little bit of Brazil that picked up quite early on and then went down. But others, and I'm gonna highlight them here, actually picked up, uh, started a little bit late, but then continued to increase and seemed to keep going up as opposed to other countries that uh, picked up early on, sort of level off and some of them seem to go in down and some of others are sort of stagnated at, at, at that level. But in the case, for example, of Me Mexico, the rates continue to go up. And this is quite relevant now with the reference to, um, Christina was mentioning before, the four Cs and uh, what type of policy could be implemented despite the fact that Mexico has never stagnated and has never leveled off and has always continued to go up, there are yet to implement more coherent, consistent policies around uh, mask wearing or about uh, physical distancing and things like that, even though the rates continue to go up. So here is the annual trend for all these countries. So what we've seen in, in this 
cases, in many of these cases uh, at the country level, is that some of the impact has to do with the comorbidities of the population. So what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to take the last, the most recent value for early December, the mortality, the standardized mortality rate for early December, and I'm going to compare that to the age standardized prevalence in this case over weight obesity, which is on the x-axis. So the higher the value, the higher the obesity uh, prevalence in a country. Here are values that are already age standardized, and here is the using data from 2019 from the Institute for Health Metrics. So what you see is countries that tend to have high mortality recently, like Mexico, tend to also have high obesity rates. Not all the cases, because Costa Rica tends to have high, but not as much high mortality. But in the case of South American countries, there seems to be a fairly interesting pattern of the higher the prevalence of obesity, the higher the standardized mortality rate. If we do the similar figure with type 2 diabetes, which is another important condition, the metabolic condition, we see a slightly similar pattern in the case of Mexico and, and here is El Salvador. Uh, and a little bit of that for these other countries, although Peru tends to have a low prevalence of, uh, of diabetes. The last comorbidity I want to show you is re with regards to smoking prevalence. When we look at the trend of smoking prevalence, I haven't explored this further, but I think part of the different results we might see here has to do with the um, heterogeneity that exists within the countries, because for instance, you can see in South American countries, it actually seems to be like a negative association. The, the countries that tend to have higher prevalence of smoking tend to have no such high mortality as opposed to the ones that have relatively low prevalence of smoking. So here are general trends that I just wanted to show with basic prevalence uh, rates of uh, overweight obesity, type 2 diabetes, and smoking prevalence. We don't have a lot of data for uh, other covariates that could be relevant, but as Patrick already mentioned, there are some national variations. He already showed some tables in which uh, some states within a country tend to have very high mortality uh, due to COVID, and that is particularly the case in large countries. In the case of Latin America, I'm thinking about Mexico and Brazil. So what I'm going to show you now is if I narrow down just in Mexico how the rates would look like. And I do this exercise that I was describing before in which we take the data for Mexico values that were projected prior to the COVID pandemic. I'm using now data with the COVID pandemic. And then we look at differences in life expectancy the before, the with and without. So here is a map to make the, help you make sense of the values. And I think uh, you don't have to be a demographer in this case to probably see immediately uh, a little bit of a trend in the case of uh, the differences in life expectancy with and without, you can see that the largest values are fairly located in this case, in the case of males and females fairly similarly in the north, a little bit in the center and a little bit in the south. And the values as particularly showed in some cases could be up to two and a half years. In the case of the north, it's close to uh, two years difference. Just to give you a sense of those places, here are some interesting facts about those places. So the Tijuana, right there, uh, Rocky Point, which a lot of people go there. Uh, Cabo, right here, another beach in here. Mexico City is the major hub in the country, the major airport. And actually one of the first cases was uh, identified in here, in Mexico City, somebody coming from abroad. And the beach areas in Cancun. In this area, there's a lot of uh, oil production. So it's a lot of movement of people going back and forth and a lot of uh, ships coming in and out in, in the country. So there is still fairly spread out impact of COVID throughout the country, but here are the kind of the main areas in which we have seen a large impacts in, in uh, of COVID. So what we did as a second step is we look at the age differences. This is what we called age decomposition, which is in essence, once we know there is a difference in life expectancy, how much contribution each age or the mortality associated with each age may be uh, contributing to the change in life expectancy. And then I look at what is the age in which there is the largest uh, loss in life expectancy. So here are the values for females, here are the values for males. So I don't, I'm not expecting you to remember all the acronyms for the states. The point of this figure is to show you if I look at the age in which there is the 
maximum loss of life expectancy. And I see if there is an age difference between those two values for men and women living in the same state, I would expect to see the values to lie within the diagonal to the extent that the values are above the diagonal. What I would suggest is that women uh, are losing years at an older age relative to men. And if the values are below the diagonal, that would suggest that women are losing years uh, the maximum at a younger age relative to males. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that this difference is fairly within five years. So in other words, in any given state, on average, the maximum loss in life expectancy occurred between the uh, 50s to say 70 years. And there is a five year gap on average between men and women. However, if we look down here, there is a little bit more countries on the lower uh, half, which suggests that potentially women are being affected a little bit more. In other words, on average, they may be losing more years of, uh, years of life at younger ages relative to males. An important point that uh, Partika, I think, also mentioned was with regards to the quality of the data, and that is particularly the case in many countries. It is difficult to get at the uh, quality of the data. So I'm showing you here one example. This is just for uh, Mexico City. Uh, what happens is in Mexico City, the, every time that that occurs, they have to fill out a death certificate. It takes a long time from that death certificate to go all the way up to the Census Bureau, which is the entity that actually reports and records the deaths in the country. Just to give you an idea, even now there is not an electronic system that records these deaths. So everything is done by paper. So these things are recorded in certain localities. The locality takes those papers, send them to several places until eventually they make their way to the main office in uh, Aguascalientes, where is the Census Bureau is located, and they put them in the system. So here is an example in which so what these people did, uh, I got data from some uh, colleagues in Mexico, they scrape the data from the death certificates that were actually filled out in Mexico City. So this is data that potentially has not yet made it into the system. And what this shows is for 2020, there is a large peak of death that's being recorded around May. Not all of these deaths are actually due to COVID because we don't have the cause of death. But what this indicates, there was a large spike in deaths happening early May. And if we look at the early figure that I showed you when I had all the countries, the peak of the mortality in Mexico, and it's about the same for Mexico City, correlated in July or August. So there is a, a large gap between the time when the death actually occurred and when it's registered. And I suspect a lot of these deaths might potentially not be counted as COVID-19. So this is just as a caveat that I wanted to uh, mention regarding the quality of the data. So just to conclude very briefly, because I have like a minute or so, uh, we've seen that there have been major impacts in of COVID, the mortality trends, oops, I missed it, the mortality trends in Latin American countries, that seems to be large variation within some countries. The impact of COVID in the Mexican population could be fairly large. In some cases, could be up to two years of life expectancy and in, in some states, particularly in the north and uh, central part in the uh, south. And this impact is quite large. In some other work that I've done, looking at the impact of violence in Mexico in the last 15 years, uh, I estimated a, a change of about a year and a half or so in life expectancy. What well, that change occurred over a period of 15 years. What we are recording now is something that has happened within the next, uh, the last seven or so months. And with that, I think I'm about right on time. Fantastic, Iram. I mean, you are, you and Patrick and Mark and Christina were perfect on time. It was me who was probably a little sloppy with time, but everybody did a great job. So um, I think rather than we're at uh, 128, I think rather than uh, asking for questions right now, uh, what I'm gonna say is I think we'll leave this line open. Uh, I don't know, Patrick and Mark and Iram, do you have a few minutes to stay around? Mm -hmm. Yep, we can stay yep. around. Okay, if you could stay around for a few minutes, we'll just leave this line open and let people ask questions. So. Why don't we just ignore the 130 deadline and everybody who needs to go, feel free to go. Uh, but um, please, uh, I'm gonna have to take off in a couple minutes, but uh, please go ahead and ask your question. So who has, who wants to start? 
I have a couple of questions. Please, Rock, go ahead. <laughs> yes, so thanks so much for the presentations. Um, so the first question is, um, is about the standardization. I think Patrick uh, talked a little bit about that. And uh, one of the things that I've sort of like uh, um, noticed uh, as well, just in, in general, is that uh, given that uh, high income countries tend to have like high prevalences of comorbidities, I wonder if there's a way to also standardize across comorbidities, because as you can imagine, there are countries where even if it's, you know, obviously there is an age difference, uh, but uh, definitely the comorbidity uh, age cannot explain all the comorbidities basically uh, in, in high income. So I wonder if it's possible or if it's ever been done to not, not only standardize uh, for, you know, across age, sex, but also comorbidities. Um, that's the first question. Yes, um, it is possible. Uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's very data uh, demanding. So you need to have um, prevalence rate of uh, at different ages. I, I still think you, you don't want to give up age. So you still wouldn't have to have the prevalence by age and gender of this different condition. And then um, some data on how more prevalent these conditions are for people who succumbed of uh, COVID-19 as opposed to those who don't. I know of one study that did that um, combining data for, so with making some inferences, combining data from Italy and from the UK, I think. Um, and I th what I thought was interesting is that they, um, they their estimates showed that the, the life expectancy or the, the remaining years of uh, life expectancy were not for people who died of COVID-19 of a given age and, and, and sex were not that much different. It was reduced by one year once you uh, took into account the prevalence of those long-term conditions, which I think was a surprise for me. And also, I, I guess, for most people would think that, you know, a lot of people who die of COVID-19 would have died, had a lot of other comorbidities and some were very frail and might have died, you know, very soon anyway. I think the estimates was that the, it, um, yeah, it reduced the life expectancy by one year. I think for male, it was from, uh, 12 to 11 years and for female it was from 14 to 13 years. So the short answer to this, I think, is that it's possible, it's been done, but it takes a lot of uh, data. And I guess the good news is that it's not maybe as big as an impact as you, you may think, um, especially when you compare with how much we're missing of people who are, we might be missing of, of, of COVID deaths. So if you think of this, this ratio of uh, about 25% uh, more excess deaths for the US. Uh, here I'm suggesting maybe it's even higher in Mexico, but the number of deaths that we are missing, which could be COVID-19 deaths or could be deaths induced by COVID-19 uh, in, in some indirect ways, um, that might be 25%. So that's almost more important of a factor than, than what you, uh, you're you looking at or what you're referring to when you're trying to calculate, let's say, the impact on life expectancy, for instance. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll ask my second question. Uh, um, and that has to do with uh, basically like comparing, um, you know, like uh, that idea of comparing uh, the burden of COVID across countries. And I'm wondering, even for the United States, because I've seen some research uh, that sort of suggested that, uh, you know, we could look at other metrics, like uh, one of them could, uh, being a uh, number of years life lost and uh, cumulative deaths. So basically calculating the the cumulative deaths, let's say, for example, in 2019, and comparing that to the cumulative deaths in, in 2020, uh, seeing, you know, to really try to see if there is actually an excess number of deaths, um, you know, overall in the year. So that's the first part of the question. The second part is, you know, what about using years of life loss? And I've seen some research that have suggested some other uh, things around that. Yes, so you're quite right. And I think that was my last slide uh, saying, you know, no one indicator is perfect. Uh, some are standardized, some are not. Some are uh, making assumption about the future, some are not. So it's, it's, there's not one single best um, indicator. There's a paper that is now, I think, in uh, the proceeding of the National Academies by um, Josh Goldstein and Ron Lee that look at a number of measure, including the no total number of years lost. Um, so yes, so you, you're, you're right. I think one of the difficulty, um, I mean, you can estimate how many years, and I think the, the, the indicator that I propose is, is pretty close to, to that, looking at the average uh, difference in the age at death of people 
uh, who died in, in 2020 and the time they would have died otherwise. Um, so again, this measure of years of uh, lost life uh, in the developed countries, I think uh, Goldstein and, and, and me say it's about 11.7 years in the US. Uh, the other study I was mentioning from the UK is at 12, 13. So that's kind of the, the, the ballpark. Uh, so now you're talking about something different, which is to how you compare that across country. Um, in, in the burden of disease literature, the, the tradition, the, the norm is to use the same life table, hypothetical life table to estimate this. Uh, and there's a couple reasons to do this. Uh, that is to use the same life table for all the countries. The first one is if you do that, you can aggregate at the word level. It becomes additive. So you can add the number of years uh, lost in, in an African country and in, in a European country, and you get, you get the global estimate. So this is a practical uh, advantage. Uh, the other more ethical issue that people uh, uh, argue is, is that, well, if life expectancy uh, is less in, in an African country than in Europe, then you give more weight to a death in Sweden, let's say, than you do in Sen Senegal, because there's uh, more uh, years to be lived by a 60-year-old. And so that's uh, unpalatable for a lot of people. Although, if you actually look at the distribution of uh, a deaths from COVID, uh, there the distribution is younger in, in, in uh, countries other than Europe just because the population structure is younger. So I, I don't think that's uh, the main factor. But uh, in the indicator that I use, I, I suggest using the life table from the specific country you're working in, in terms of trying to get an estimate of how many, uh, how much younger people were compared to the age at, at best they were projected to have otherwise. So that's, that was your part of your question on, on uh, one uh, on the uh, year lost to there yeah. was another part. Yeah, the yeah. other part was just like the cumulative number of deaths. Um, yeah. You know, like let's say in 2019, in 2020, like if you look at just the United States, I wonder if there was a, a huge difference or not. Yes. Uh, so so right now, um, I think the no number like we mentioned, I mentioned the the number of. Uh, deaths due to COVID-19 is approaching 300,000 as, as you know, recorded by John Hopkins University. And you may add maybe 20% uh, to this as uh, sort of the number of excess deaths, which is, is probably about 350,000. Uh, and uh, again, going back to Boston and, and, and Lee paper, I th it's about half of all the opioid uh, overdose uh, deaths over three years, which I think in, were in the order of 700,000, and about the same for all of the HIV deaths uh, in, in the US. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I will just add, uh, Rock, relative to your question of excess deaths, it gets a little bit tricky, because it, it is always tricky to decide which is going to be the reference point. You were mentioning if you accumulated, you know, that's from 2019, but as Patrick has done some work before, if you accumulate the last year, you might get a different result if you say, well, what if I use the last two years to sort of smooth things out for whatever reason something might have happened in 2019, let's take the last two. And then some people might say, no, let's take the last 10 years. So, you know, to get even a more smooth sort of pattern of what has happened. And then every time you do that, you get a different result. And the excess deaths tend to vary quite a lot, depending on that assumption. Yes, Thank that's you. a very good point. I mean, excess deaths may sound like a much better uh, way to look at this because it's not uh, dependent on how we identify the cause of deaths. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, Iram is right. It's very dependent on what you take as a benchmark. And you may think that the number of deaths is fairly stable from country to, uh, from, from Europe to Europe, but it's not you know, because of the seasonal flu. Uh, in particular, there's quite substantial variation. So if you if you take 2019 as a reference for 2020, or if you take a, a longer period, you you get fairly, I mean, not hugely different number. But it's 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 if you keep in mind that even the big toll that COVID-19 has, that's only about 10% of what normal deaths are um, in in a regular year. So if you off in your if you know if there's variation from year to year in order of five percent, that that has a huge impact on how you estimate the number of excess deaths. Oh, thank you. <laughs>
Any other questions? I, well, if there's no other question, I had one from Mark earlier, maybe since you, I saw you stayed around. So I have, I have you've been struggling with this issue of what is the best unit of analysis, and and you presented data on neighborhood, and um, I and Christina and, and Iram also presented uh, data on on from states. So I imagine from a model's point of view, uh, if you have something that is uh, too large, uh, you have a lot of uh, heterogeneity and unrelated ep epidemic and so you have you averaging out thing and you're losing a lot of information but if, if you have something too small you're treating as exogenous things that you may want to have in your in your model how, how, do, how do you think about uh, this well, uh, it's clearly a difficult question but the natural way you know i would think about it is that you would model the data at the finest degree of aggregation that it's recorded uh, presuming it's a spatial ag aggregation but then you must induce dependency amongst the units. So if you treat the units as in independent or separate from each other, clearly then that's an enormous problem with the exogeneity, as you said. But what you would do is either put in a direct spatial model if it was a geographic distance, or what probably makes more sense is some sort of social spatial distance amongst the actual units to induce dependency amongst them. So I think you can do it with a modeling approach, but it requires to have a more sophisticated modeling approach. For example, in what Christina did, she used this you know, idea of this mixture model, this hier hierarchical model to induce the dependencies. And something like that, or a more explicitly spatial or more explicitly uh, spatial social model, I think it would be called, called for. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, that's quite, uh, quite useful. Okay, so I guess there are no more questions. All right, if there are no more questions, I wanna thank everyone for attending the seminar and the, the panelists research is actually posted on the CCPR website. So please feel free to check that out after the seminar. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.